Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Jay Shambaugh. Jay is a professor of economics and international affairs at the George Washington University. Formerly, he was a member of the White House Council of Economic Advisors and is a visiting scholar at the IMF. He has published widely in the field of macroeconomics and international finance. Today, he joins us to talk about his work on the macroeconomic trilemma, international reserve growth, and the Eurozone crisis. Jay, welcome to the show. Thanks very much. It's great to be here. Oh, we're glad to have you on. We've followed your work over the years, and I would like to know, how did you get into economics, and particularly into international economics? So I think how I got into economics, I, you know, my dad worked in the finance industry some, and, and I think as a kid, just talking to him about, you know, unemployment and inflation, and so it's, you know, late 70s, early 80s, and topics of what's going on with inflation or what's why is unemployment so high were very much things you saw mm-hmm. in the news. I think how I got to international economics was I was always inter- interested in the international affairs side of things. Okay. I actually don't know that I intended to be an economist. I, mm-hmm. I was always interested more from the international affairs angle. And then some combination of interest and comparative advantage kept always drawing me over more towards economics. And so I found myself always kind of fascinated with the watching currencies move around, but less so the financial industry side of that as much as the who's making the choice that's driving these things. What are the fundamental policy choices mm-hmm. being made? That's ha- And how is it having all these big effects in the world were always things that seemed to interest me. And then eventually I went and got a PhD to, to study them and think about them more. I think you're right. It's hard to understand the world without understanding economics. Yeah, no. And I think that was... I in some ways almost tried to avoid getting a PhD in economics because I was enjoying kind of just thinking about and studying yeah. these issues and then eventually realized if I really wanted to work on them in detail, I needed to go and kind of tool up and get yeah. the training to be able to 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 think about these issues. So I think I, you meet some people in econ PhD programs who they're in some sense applied mathematicians looking yep. for a yep. subject <laughs> and then there are people who come from the other direction, which is definitely where I came from, which was the you're interested in a topic and you're you're getting the skills mm-hmm. and the tools to be able to think about it more deeply. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's talk about your time at the Council of Economic Advisors. Sure. Tell us about the roles you played there. What topics did you cover? And, and what was your interaction with policymakers? So I had two stints at the CEA. I was there um, from 2009 to 11. I came in on staff as a senior economist, which is kind of where they bring in people who are either assistant or associate professors. Usually you come in you spend one year, you're you're kind of dedicated to a topic. So mine was international econ, which meant I covered kind of all of international macro and international trade. So academics makes you specialize very narrowly. And when you get to the CEA, you realize, <laughs> you know, you are the person who's covering this very broad portfolio. Um, and then I stuck around, did a second year as the chief economist where I kind of had a broader portfolio. And then I came back for the last year and a half of the administration as a member, which uh, where there you have a much bigger portfolio just because there are only there's a chair and two members. So the kind of two members as deputies basically divide the world in half. And so I had kind of this broader portfolio of things like international and macro and competition and housing and, and energy environment, things like that. Well, while you were there, what international issues were you know at the forefront? What were centering? so I think um, all along trade policy, there's always issues, mm-hmm. you know, questions of. Um, they can be incredibly minute questions as the kind of, you know, 30 year fight over bananas between the U.S. and the EU, you know, rolls on things like that, uh, where you think this doesn't seem very important. But then you realize it's it's all about precedence and it's all about are you enforcing the rules or not. And so there were a lot of issues along along those lines. Um, and then on the uh, international macro side, certainly our relationship with China was always in some sense front and center when I was. First there, China had repegged and had, you know, they had been allowing a slow appreciation against the dollar and then they'd repegged during the crisis. And that was something that was making everyone very nervous. The question of how was China expecting to go back directly to kind of the old growth model of purely export led growth, just depend on the U.S. consumers and engine. And we were sitting there trying to say, 
you're a much bigger country now. That's not really a viable growth model for you, and it's not sustainable for us. Um, and I think actually over time that message did sink in on both sides that you know we're not going back to the mid 2000s. That's not a growth model for the world that works, and mm -hmm. and not a growth model for China and the U.S. that works. Um, and then interestingly, on the flip side, coming back, uh, I got back just a couple of weeks after China had tried to change their exchange rate regime in some way and, and how they were setting the overnight rate that led to a lot of uncertainty in the markets and, and led to a fairly persistent depreciation of the RMB against the dollar, which then had its own yeah. you know, flip side of un discomfort in the US. Is this kind of a deliberate competitive attempt or is this they really have lost control here, in which case the markets would occasionally flare up and you'd see things in August or in January 2016 where everyone was very nervous in the markets and you start worrying, is this going to spill over much more broadly? Um, so there were always interesting questions there. Europe was, of course, always the other thing going on. <laughs> right. um, uh, in some ways, it was always this thing where we had thoughts and opinions and we would share them. But um, And sometimes I think they were shared and and really listened to. I think the U.S. How much Europe wanted to hear from the U.S. varied over over the course of of the last seven years, and how much they were just entirely trying to deal with disagreements within within European governments. And the eurozone crisis is a tough nut to crack. We'll talk more about that yeah. later. Uh, but during your first stint, was QE two going on? Because I remember that created some international tension. Did yes. you have to deal with that? So um, only to the extent that at various international meetings, whether it was at the OECD or whether when we'd, we'd have a uh, dialogue with China, mm -hmm. um, we were often, the CEA was often the people sitting next to the Fed. And so, you know, if they started yelling at the Fed, we would basically duck um, and, and quite <laughs> coming. Yes. And, and frankly, they wanted us to, you know, from our perspective, yeah. you know, the White House was not going to comment on monetary policy. And for that matter, the White House wasn't going to comment on exchange rate policy. You know, that was being left to Treasury Secretary was the person who talks about the dollar. And the Fed is the person who talks about monetary policy. Actually, for me, as someone who studies international macro and currency, it was often a somewhat ironic position that the only things I wasn't allowed to talk about were the things that I felt like in some sense I knew the most about. Um, and everything else was fair game. Um, but, but certainly... Uh, QE2 was something that um, the Fed was taking flack for while we were there at times. Um, you know, the question of well, you're debasing your currency and you're exporting inflation and things like that was something we're certainly hearing a lot of. The Fed would obviously then take the position. We're gearing at our domestic economy. That's our job. That's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. If there are spillovers, that's not what we're focused on. We're not doing this to, to deliberately make the dollar cheaper. We're doing this. Right. to stimulate the economy. Um, and they would argue the spillovers from that were, frankly, more positive to the rest of the world than whatever the other spillovers were. Well, I wonder what your, your take is on the effect QE2 had on China's real exchange rate. Um, in, in the sense, so bef kind of before the crisis, you know, the, as you mentioned yeah. earlier, the, the big cr criticism was China was undervaluing its currency. And today right. we think it's, it's, it's where it should be, or maybe even a little higher than it should be. But between that period, there's some adjustment taking place. Yeah. Did QE2 force that inflation into China and cause a real appreciation at all? You know, I actually don't think it did too okay. much of that. And I think where you, where you really see it is where they started to face trouble was when, in some sense, most of the accommodative policy ended in the United States. And the, the run-up from mid-2014 to early 2016 mm, in yep. the dollar uh, was just something that you know, basically a year in, they look around and realize, well, we've been staying basically flat with the dollar, but we've appreciated 10% or more on, on a trade weighted okay. basis. And that's what eventually led them to try to switch the exchange rate okay. regime and say, well, we've got we've to de-link from the dollar. We can't have all the focus be on the, the dollar RMB mm -hmm. because sometimes we don't want to ride with the dollar. And I think um, they correctly could see that the Fed was going to be tightening before everyone else, and they didn't want to go for that ride. Um, of course, they'd already caught most of it by then, um, right. and they were trying to, in some sense, unwind a lot of that. So in some ways, despite, you know, when other countries would complain about the, um, the, uh, the QE policies or things like that, from China's perspective, there are some advantages, right? They're, they can stay constant with the dollar and get cheaper against the world, or they could even crawl up slightly against the dollar, mm -hmm. which 
made their interlocutors in the United point. States yeah. very happy. Um, and they weren't getting any more expensive against the rest of the world. And so it was when that ended and all of a sudden they were going the other way with us that I think it really became a challenge for them. Yeah, that's, that's a fair point. I've, I've brought that up with previous guests too. The appreciation from mid-2014, I mean, up until the end of uh, 2015, and, and there's been some up and down, it's kind of plateaued. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's almost over 20% appreciation yep. in the dollar, which is, is a really rapid rise. And China was tied to yep. that, which is mind-blowing, right? They have their own internal problems. And on top of that, they're going to you know, tie themselves to the the dollar ship and, and be pulled up. Yeah, we we used to draw pictures and say, you know, there were kind of three great waves of dollar appreciation you've seen since 1973. And this was one of them, right? You know, mm -hmm. this is not a blip. This was a real and concerted and very rapid rise in the dollar um and exactly and you know any country that was pegged to the dollar for that run was suddenly finding themselves a lot more expensive against their trading partners and so i think that's why china wanted to both delink a little bit from the dollar but also i think they somewhat quite clearly wanted to get some of that back that they they weren't comfortable just mm -hmm. kind of staying flat on a trade weighted basis they felt like they had run up too much and they wanted to unwind some of that and so they they allowed that to happen. Well, let me ask you about this. This is a nice diversion in, into Fed policy sure. and its international reach. So I think one of the key reasons that it went up is the Fed started talking up rate hikes. Janet yep. Yellen comes in. I think she needs to prove herself. She's talking up rate hikes. Also, the economy. I mean, there's some fundamentals, not just that the Fed's kind of following the fundamentals to some extent. And so they're talking up rates. Meanwhile, the ECB and Bank of Japan are talking down. They're going negative. So you yep. have this this big divergence, the, the expected path of interest rates between the U.S. and the other two big money centers um, are diverging rapidly, and that drives up the, the dollar. And there's all these concerns with this. Number one, there's a large number of countries that are loosely or tightly or in between pegged to the dollar, right? The dollar block, China's right. one of them you just mentioned. That, that's one thing. So whatever the Fed does, they kind of have to go along for the ride. Fed does tighter monetary policy, they, ha they take it. Uh, th the other concern is the BIS, the Bank for National Settlements, reports there's about $10 trillion or so of, of dollar-denominated debt out there yeah. outside the U.S. Yeah. that foreigners have to bear the liability. So if, if the dollar goes up and um, their currencies don't keep up with it, the real debt burden for them is, is, goes up as well. So there, there's many stresses yeah. th through which Fed policy can affect the world. I think Governor Brainerd has been mindful of this. Yes. But my sense as a whole, they... And maybe I'm being unfair. <laughs> Push back on this, and, and I know they have a domestic mandate, but but to the extent to which, when they set monetary policy, they really are messing things up in the global economy. I think they are aware of it. I think the way you see that they're aware of it is that they, they the hikes they did were nowhere near the pace they expected to make. Okay, them, right, and so they're they're aware of it to the extent that the feedback kicks in, uh, and that affects the things that they are quite okay. carefully looking at. So, you know, the dollar gets stronger, commodity prices go down, and they suddenly find themselves with much, much, much less pressure on prices than they were expecting. This, you know, they say, well, boy, unemployment's low. The economy seems like it should be hitting mm -hmm. the point where, where you start to see pressure, but there was no, no pressure on inflation. And so they, they did, in some sense, to their credit, they, they deviated from the path they had yeah. laid out and said, we don't need to go as fast. And I think you see that. I mean, the one thing I will say about the $10 trillion in, in liabilities abroad, um, there are a lot of assets too, That's right? That's a fair point. And yeah. so um, one of the differences, I think, today versus, say, 1997, um, this is uh, work I've done with Philip Lane, who's actually now the, back when he was an academic, he's now the head of the Central Bank of Ireland, but um, is looking at the currency composition of balance sheets of countries. And if you go back far enough, Emerging markets were just incredibly short foreign currency, right? They borrowed in foreign currency. They had no assets. But over time, they built up a lot of assets. Okay. And they started taking on more debt not in foreign currency. They still There's still a lot of it, but they've taken some you know, FDI and equity that's effectively local currency. And so one of the things you saw in this crisis was countries depreciated and didn't turn into basket cases immediately. Um, and that was really important. You know, you saw in some sense both in 2008 and 9, and then again in the taper tantrum. You saw big moves in currencies at times. And then, you know, in some sense, the other shoe didn't drop. There wasn't some massive financial crisis where all of their banks were insolvent because they'd borrowed so much in foreign currency and had no assets. You actually saw, you know, the emerging markets do better than 
you know, they were okay. in some sense dragging along the U.S., Euro, Japan, slow growth regions um, during the crisis. So I think it's out there and it's it's got huge impacts in some countries where they are short foreign currency mm -hmm. or frankly, in a lot of cases, they're not short foreign currency, but they're short dollars. Um, and so when the dollar runs differently from everyone else, that has real okay. impacts. Um, but I, I do think it's it winds up being kind of this complicated set of of things where it's also sometimes, you know, you can have banks in China short dollars. The government's got three trillion of them. Right. So, you know, their assets are suddenly worth a lot more. Now, now you have to figure out what do we do within our right. economy? We've got some either institutions or the government with assets that are appreciating and others where their liabilities are appreciating. And do you just wash those out together or do some go bankrupt and some not? And so I think that's where it, it certainly has big effects. And I think dollar movements and Fed policy has big, big impacts on the rest of the world. Well, that's encouraging because I get the impression, which may be a poorly informed one, that this is a big deal. But what you're mm -hmm. saying is it's, it's, it's not as big of a deal because balance sheets are better diversified. Uh, and you don't see the problems you saw in the emerging market I, crisis. I think they, I, I don't want to say it's not a big deal because, I mean, frankly, when we were being asked, you know, what are the things that, what are the mm -hmm. things that scare you? When I was at CEA, you know, we would talk about rapid credit growth in some countries and the extent to which a lot of it was dollar based. And so that was something that made us nervous. Um, I guess what I'm saying is that I think the, the headline numbers don't mean the same thing they used to okay. in the sense that there are, yes, there are liabilities, but there are assets in some cases too. And, and again, some, sometimes there aren't, sometimes it's Indian multinationals who can borrow in New York and then they turn around and invest locally and they're basically doing carry trades and mm. that's really dangerous. <laughs> right, um, right. It, it's, you know, the old picking up nickels in front of steamrollers yeah. story. And that's all well and good as long as you're faster than the steamroller. <laughs> so, so going back to the fed, just briefly here. So, I mean, you make a fair point that the Fed failing to live up to its four hikes that it had promised yeah. was either a direct or an indirect recognition by them that their policies do have global ramifications. Yeah. So, and, and maybe to be fair to them as well, you know, maybe they are very aware of, of the feedback effect, but given their domestic mandate, they can't say, hey, we're not going to raise rates because things around the world are blowing up. They've got to say they're doing things because of domestic inflation or domestic yeah. activity. And I think that's even something that you've seen through the G7 and the G20. Uh, everyone encourage everyone else to behave this way. Right? Like there was a lot of pressure on Japan at times mm -hmm. to say, look, if you want to, if Abenomics means a rapid increase in the money supply, that's fine. And if all of us sitting around the table can do the math and say a rapid increase in the money supply is going to lead to yen depreciation, we're not going to say anything about that. But if you start saying you're targeting yen depreciation, or if you start talking down the yen because you're trying to make it move, you know, that we have a problem with. And, it, okay. and I think you've seen um, in a lot of the statements from the G7 and, and especially statements along the lines of we'll use domestic tools for domestic purposes. And as long as the Fed is saying, "Hey, what we're we're do we're looking at our mandate," mm -hmm. that doesn't mean you don't think about how the international channels feed into your mandate. But it probably is from a from a global perspective something they prefer not to make the front and center thing to say, "Boy, the dollar's expensive. We're not going to hike." Yeah. <laughs> I think it's something that would make everyone else around the world uncomfortable. And then they'd sit there and say, "Well, then why can't I?" you know, target my exchange rate and right. try to become cheap. And so I think the view is th the spillovers are there. And it, it may be the case that sometimes they don't anticipate the spillovers as much. And maybe that's why they laid out the course that was more aggressive than they eventually followed. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't until they saw how much it moved the dollar and how big an effect that was having that they had to say, okay. we need we need a different rate path here. Yeah. Um, but I think we'll see it again. I mean, they they're forecasting a couple more hikes if the dollar responds to that and and kind of picks up again, you know, I I would wonder how much they can continue that path because they're again, it'll slow down inflation, it'll slow down the US economy. It it will wind up doing the things the rate hikes were supposed to do, and they may not need as many rate hikes as they thought. Yeah. Very interesting. Well, let's let's move on to some of your uh research that you've sure. done. Fascinating conversation. I could go on a long time on that, but let's Let's move to some of the work you've done. And you've done a lot of work on the macroeconomic trilemma. Yes. And I want to get into it. Be before we get into what it is and the work you've done, 
I want to make sure I have the name right. So I've heard it called just the trilemma, the macroeconomic trilemma, and also the impossible trinity. Is there a proper term? Which one should I use of those? So I historically have always used trilemma. Okay. Um, I've noticed lately people coming up with other trilemmas. Um, and so I think that has led people to try to say, be a little more clear and say, I mean the macroeconomic trilemma okay. here when I, when mm -hmm. I say it. Um, people used to call it the impossible trinity. I think in some sense, just because of my co you know, uh, Mario Seldon, Alan Taylor kind of named it the trilemma. And since I've written with them a bunch, I'm almost contractually obligated to continue <laughs> referring to it right. that way. Um, I don't know if it was a discomfort with the religious overtones or something oh, that made people look for a more secular term. I'm not, I'm not sure. <laughs> nice. Um, but yeah, yeah so that's, okay. I, I tend to just call it the trilemma. trilemma. But, yeah. Okay. Fair enough. All right. Well, why don't you describe for our listeners, what is the trilemma? So the, the basic idea is there are three things a government might want to do. And we don't have to stipulate they want to do all of them, but they might want to. And that's have exchange rate stability, open financial markets where, where money can move across borders. Mm -hmm and have some ability to use monetary policy for domestic purposes so that we'll often refer to as domestic monetary autonomy. And the idea of the trilemma is you can't have all three, that you can, only, you can at most have two of these three things. And the most basic idea behind it is if I peg my currency to you and money can flow across borders, if I try to lower my interest rates relative to you, then people are money's going to flow away from my country because people say, well, gee, I can get a better interest rate over there. And the act of them kind of selling my currency and buying yours is going to start to make my currency depreciate. And if I've said I want exchange rate stability, then I can't do that. And so I have to make a choice between changing the interest rate or keeping the currency stable. And the idea is the other option I would have would be to throw up capital controls, not let the money move across borders, in which case I could fix the currency where I want and move my interest rates up and down however I want. Um, but basically, I have to pick a, some combination of these. Um, if you wanted none of them, you certainly could. You could close your financial markets, let the exchange rate bounce all over and never move interest rates. Um, but the point is, if in theory, all of these have some advantage to them, mm -hmm. you, you can't have all three. I think the at its fundamental core, what it's really about is trade-offs. And, okay. and so in that sense, you don't have to pick purely two and none of the other. It's saying if you want more of one, you've got to give up some of one of the other. And so if I want a little more exchange rate stability, I can maybe buy that with a little less capital mobility. Um, or if, if I've got, if I'm open and I'm pegged and I want a little bit ability to move my monetary policy around, well, I can maybe loosen the bands on the exchange rate, let it bounce around up and down 5% instead of up and down 1%. Or I can throw some sand in the wheels of, of financial flows. Um, I think if you look at China most recently, that's clearly the choice they made, that um, they didn't want to always have to follow the Fed necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, and the they were uncomfortable with the extent the exchange rate was moving. And so they tightened capital controls quite severely in the last year. And that's one way around. And so you can kind of play these levers against each other. Yeah. So I want to go through some countries and you tell me yeah. what they're doing. But you mentioned China. So let's go there first. So, so China, one can make the argument they're kind of, you, you make it, I, I like the, the idea of a trade off. So it's not all or nothing. You can yeah. be on the margins. But one of the implications of this is that it's not sustainable to do all three in a pronounced manner, right? Absolutely. At some point, it'll come home to bite you in the rear and have a financial crisis. So is, is China at that point? Are, are they trying to do too much? So I think they, in some sense, they were. So China, actually, once in a while, um, some officials would come out and say, we've solved the trilemma. Like, explicitly, really? And say, we, <laughs> we've beaten it. Now, in some sense, there's this fourth element out there that I didn't mention, which is intervention in currency markets with reserves. Okay. Right. And the implication is if unless you have some capital controls, that's just not going to be effective on a sustained mm. basis. But I think China, through a combination of kind of following the Fed, but not really having some capital controls, but they were getting looser and looser. And then, yeah, they were pushing that envelope a little too far and the currency was moving more than they were comfortable with. And they had even despite intervention and after a trillion dollars or so of reserves intervention, they said, this is more than we want. And, and they tightened the capital controls quite a bit. 
So they were maybe cheating on the margin, and they felt the they felt the pressure, and they felt the pressure, off. and had to back off. In okay. Way. So do we have any country that truly completely blocks capital flows? I mean, with North Korea is North only, Korea is okay. a great example. Okay, that's the only uh, one that comes to mind. Yeah, I mean, I think with capital controls, there's a huge, there's a a real continuum, mm-hmm. and so that's there's always you know there are the countries that it's kind of hard to move money across the border in any kind of quick way. And then there are the countries that by and large, just there may, might be rules, there might be some macro prudential controls from the central bank, but by and large, if money's going across borders, they're not interfering with it. And you basically got a spectrum in between that. It, it's the it's certainly a hard, hard one to measure. And so, you know, the empirics of this get tricky, different people measure it in different ways. Um, but that's it's it's you're certainly right that there's no one that really was all the way on the close side usually today if you go back in history you certainly see it and so the one of the first paper i wrote with with maury and allen um it was called the trilemma in history and and we we found that one of the nice things about going back historically is you have almost much more stark choices in it so you go to the gold standard right there aren't really capital controls across the major economies at all they just in some sense, hadn't really thought of doing it, right? You were allowed to put gold on a boat and move it if you wanted to. Hmm. Um, and that's one. And then on the other hand, they're perfectly fixed, right? They, they're on the gold standard. Right. And there, there's a rigid fixed exchange rate system. And so it wasn't, in some sense, countries choosing their solution to the trilemma. It was broadly the system. There was an international monetary system that was open financial markets, fixed exchange rate no ability to use interest rates for monetary autonomy at all. And in some sense, there really wasn't an ethic of doing so at the time. So it wasn't really seen as much of a cost. You you come through the depression where people decide, boy, there's really a cost to not having mm-hmm. that monetary policy tool. Um, and they decide to swing to the other direction. And you get the Bretton Woods arrangement where you've got fairly tight capital controls. Money was really not moving especially in the first decade or two after World War II, still fixed exchange rates. Um, but because you've got the capital controls, now there's a lot more monetary autonomy and countries can move their interest rates differentially from the U.S. because they can. They, you know, There's nothing mm-hmm. stopping them. Um, and so you get those two periods where you can really see it starkly. Interesting. And, and how much countries are following the what we would call the base country interest rate is just very, very sharply different in those two periods despite the fact that the exchange rates are fixed in both. And the difference is the capital controls. And then you can come out the other side and find a lot of countries um, in the last four decades or so who have floating exchange rates um, and open financial markets. And again, seem to be able to move their exchange, their interest rate differentially from the U.S. or, or other large countries. That's a fascinating historical case study. Can you use the trilemma to also makes sense of why these things ended or why they blew up. So for for example, we mentioned earlier, if you try to do all three yeah. in a pronounced level, at some point things are going to blow up. So I think like, like the interwar gold standard, like yeah. France began to uh, sterilize gold inflows. Right. And so was was France trying to do all three? I'm, I'm not. I'm, no, I mean, in some sense, you, you ran in the interwar years. We wound up actually not using them in the first paper because it's, it's so messy. We just wrote a separate paper just okay. on that one, uh, that episode. And... In some sense, it's you run into this thing where the the big countries who, you know, the U.S. and France in particular, yeah. were acting in a way where gold was flowing into them, and it's putting pressure on everyone else. Right. And it's no everyone else either has to ride with France and the U.S. and tighten monetary policy, or blow up the gold standard. And you you really do see, in some sense, this fracturing where countries make different choices. Right? You've got a block of countries that say we're still on gold, but they've instituted really rigid exchange controls, kind of the exchange control block in Europe. You've got other countries that just give up on gold, right? And there are those neat pictures you can draw that show kind of as soon as a country gives up the gold standard, Mm -hmm. they tend to reflate and get out of the depression faster, right? right? And so in many ways, it was countries just saying, I want the monetary autonomy. The gold standard's not worth it to me. I'm out. And so they, they didn't close their capital markets. They just gave up on being rigidly pegged to gold at that rate that they were. And that lets them use their monetary lower interest rates, 
kind of print more money yeah. and try to reflate out of the depression. Well, now that Doug Irwin has that interesting paper, yeah. um, and it's interesting, <laughs> blame the French and the U.S. for making the Great Depression what it was. Um, but but I'm, I'm trying to like, I may be wrong here, yeah. but take this framework and let's apply it to the U.S. in particular. Sure. So they, they had the fixed exchange rate, they're on the gold, um, capital was allowed to flow, right? Yep. But then they, they were also tinkering with, with interest rates. So didn't they adjust their rates to help Great Britain and, yeah. to, and, to, and to nip the stock market boom? So were they violating all three and did so this contribute? The gold standard is kind of a funny thing because there's no one base country, right? So you've oh, all okay. got in some sense a gold cover rate. So it's, it's much easier to tell the story when you've got everyone's pegged to one country and they okay. have to follow that one country. In the gold standard, there's no center country. Um, and instead, everybody's got to watch their own gold cover ratio. And what it does is it, it puts the surplus countries in a big advantage because gold is flowing into them. And as you said with Frank, you know, you can sterilize that and, and still be pegged on the gold standard, whereas the deficit countries are in trouble because they're the ones who are about to break the rules. And so in the gold standard, you can raise rates and gold flows in. And as long as you are able to sterilize that, that's fine. And and that in some sense is one okay. of the one of the flaws of it was that okay. that raising rates and sterilizing works out okay for the for country you. doing it. Right. It's just that everyone else then all is right, kind of right. stuck in this in this situation. I, I, I added some clarity then the, the use of the trilemma. I mean, this this kind of goes back to this question of the gold standard itself, right? So it, it worked relatively well with the classical gold standard period, like from 1870 to 1914, yeah. but it was a big disaster in the interwar period. So Barry Eichengreen tells a story, and I think it's a common one, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on it, that it worked well back then. I, I think his key argument is it worked well back then because people were less in, enfranchised, that, that they had no expectation that a politician would yeah. care about domestic stability. And, and the beauty of it, of course, is, is you had international stability. I mean, you, you didn't have yeah. big sustained deficits because gold would flow across borders. But once we get to the interwar period, people do care. Yeah. And and so I've heard another version of the story is by the point you get to, the time you get to that point central banks are managed are actively managing the gold standard whereas they, they weren't before, but the reason they're managing is because there's this domestic political pressure to do something. Yeah, I, is that a reasonable story? Yeah, I mean I think I've seen the argument that you know after World War One the franchise gets extended a lot more broadly and suddenly people mm -hmm. not just have an expectation but a voice to and to drive that expectation. I think we shouldn't overestimate how well the classical gold standard worked. You know, okay. you go back and think of the populist movement in the United States. You know, what was their chief target? Their chief target was the gold standard, right? Because in particular, the farmers are are facing falling prices, and you know, debtors aren't really fond of falling prices. And so, if you've borrowed to for your farm equipment or for your seed or whatever it is, mm -hmm. you know, you're in trouble if if prices are falling. And so. You get the Williams Jennings Bryan, right? You know, you shall not crucify man on this cross of gold, famous convention speech. And I think it, but, you know, the U.S. was unusual in that the franchise was a lot broader in the U.S. than it was in a lot of other countries pre-World War I. And so I think you do see that there always were some tensions in that you were gearing your monetary policy at this external target. You weren't paying attention at all to anything internal. Right. And that can lead to some frustrations. Prices were probably more flexible. I was going to ask. And I think that matters, matter. okay, right? So yeah. prices were downwardly flexible in ways that they, over time, became less right. so. And I think that that mattered to this so that you could get away with it more in the gold standard. And then honestly, the gold standard may have blown up earlier if we hadn't found gold in Alaska, right? So the whole populist movement that wanted free coinage of silver mm -hmm. and wanted to get away from the gold standard, um, then we find gold. And so you loosen monetary policy because you found a lot more gold. Um, and so in that sense, there was this stroke of luck that, that kept it from the, from some of those tensions from boiling over more than that, than they were at the time. I mean, there's a lot of arbitrariness, that's the word, to, to the gold standard yes. in the sense that like who sets the initial exchange rates, right? Isaac right. Newton. I mean, and then it's, I mean, it's changed later. I'm in time of Andrew Jackson. Mm -hmm. Is that right? And a lot of this is just due to politics by, by luck. The fact that the U.S. became a gold standard and not a silver standard was because of the fluctuating exchange rates, right? Yeah. So I, I appreciate the enthusiasm for the gold standard in the sense people want the price stability. You know, they, and they're thinking back to the classical gold standard, but I think there's also a bit of history there that's underappreciated that it wasn't always a clean 
well thought out exercise, right? Well, I also think that the price stability is very much overrated, right? So you look at U.S. prices fell, I think it's something like 40 percent um, from the time we got on the gold standard until you strike gold in Alaska. So you've got growing output, but the mon- money supply is really not moving very rapidly. And so prices are falling. Um, and again, if prices are more flexible because you have fewer written contracts and you don't have long-term contracts and things like that, maybe you can get away with it some, but it, it certainly was something that, that was an issue. I always say when people talk about the price stability is you've got this idea, you're making one price stable, the price of an ounce of gold. All the other prices are moving depending on the relative price of mm-hmm. the price of gold. So you can look at the price of milk over the last 40 years in terms of gold or in terms of dollars. It's a lot more stable in dollars than it is in gold because you get big fluctuations in the price of gold relative to dollars. And so, you know, you kind of have the choice. You could have the central bank target one price or you could have the central bank target a basket of prices. Now, targeting one price has the advantage. It's perfectly visible. There's no question as to whether the central bank has successfully achieved its target. And so that's something I think people like about it. On the other hand, it's not clear. I care about the price of an ounce of gold being stable, but I have a lot more interest in the price of the basket of goods and services I buy being relatively stable. Well, I'm a nominal GDP target sure. kind of guy, but let me let me play the devil's advocate sure. here, just because the listeners out there are you know, pulling their hair out right now. <laughs> it's true that you're targeting like the gold, but if, if you look at like price level measures, they were relatively stable over long periods of time, and and even I know the like the postbellum period, you do yeah. see that decline. But it was a gradual, it was gradual so yeah. it was expected. It's not kind of the unexpected uh, Great Depression deflation, yeah. right? So I think they would say, well, we, they, yeah, we ha- there were ups and there was downs, but on average, a relatively stable price level. Whereas when we moved to fiat, we had this massive explosion in the 60s and 70s. Yeah. So there was, I mean, I think there's something to the argument. There was this discipline. But but I think as we said that it came at a cost that's that's underappreciated maybe today by the advocates of gold standard. Well, I think it, it clearly has it, what it does is it disciplines the central bank. So if you think your primary concern is that you can't make your central bank act responsibly, mm-hmm. then there's a strong appeal to something like the gold standard. It's also why countries in many cases fix the exchange rate. Right. It provides the exact same nominal anchor instead of picking the price of an ounce of gold, you pick the price of a given currency and stabilize that. It's visible. Every morning in Argentina, I could wake up and see, oh, it's still one peso for one dollar. The central bank yeah. hasn't cheated in the last 24 hours. Um, but on the other hand, um, if you think that you can find a different way to discipline your central bank, if you can come up with an institution that follows a, a certain broad set of rules or structures or incentives that you think is able to provide broad price stability for a basket of goods, I think that's probably preferable right now. If you don't trust them, if you don't think you can do it, then you say, well, no, I I don't want the fiat currency. I I need this nominal anchor. I need something tangible and real. Um, I think, you know, you look at the last 40 years of central banking and it suggests that if you want, you can get central banks to keep the CPI relatively Mm -hmm. growing at the rate you tell them you want it to grow at and therefore stabilizing relative to to one asset price is probably not what we want. Yeah, and I think ultimately the issue is credibility of, the, of our institutions, right? Yeah. It's not gold standard. It's not you know inflation targeting. It's whether they are committed to price stability or nominal stability. Right. Um, and and that, I think that's another point maybe some people miss is just returning to the gold standard is not going to suddenly change everything. I had a review of book once of an individual who – who's been beside himself since the 1970s when Nixon took us off gold. And, and he goes as far as to make arguments that civilization has suffered and you know, would be restored suddenly back to the heights of glory. And I, are, I, what I wrote in the piece is like, look, I, I think the, the real issue here is, is deeper institutional quality and commitments to, you know, gold center is just, is just, a, it's just a commitment to mechanism, but, yeah. but so is inflation targeting, right? Yeah. It's just a different form. And, and yeah, we had a period where we really messed up in the mid- 60s, 70s, early 80s. Um, that was kind of the learning curve for fiat. I'm a big advocate of nominal GDP level targeting, but that's a different discussion. But okay. I, I do think, going back to the one point you made about increased price rigidity, I yeah. do think that makes it a, a tougher argument, a tougher sell for gold standard. I mean, I, I, 
And that's why I think like money demand shocks are important, and and that's why I'm a fan of nominal GDP targeting. Yeah. Well, let, let's move on. These are fascinating conversations, but we're talking about the trilemma here. Sure. You had m- many papers on this. You mentioned some of them, um, but you went through one. Let me see if I have the name here. Is the trilemma in history right. trade offs among exchange rates, monetary policy, and capital mobility? And you went through and basically tested this idea over 130 years, right? Right. And what did you find? Well, we found basically that the trilemma broadly held, right? That um, if you look in the gold standard era, countries are following British interest rates. Uh, If you look in Bretton Woods, there's a lot more freedom from the capital controls. And you look post Bretton Woods where you've got what in later work, I co-author and I, Michael Klein, referred to it as the modern era because it was almost like the modern era of painting when painters are doing lots of different styles all in one era. You know, you get that now. It's not that the system has picked the solution. Now countries are picking their own solution. And within that modern era or post Bretton Woods era, you can find, you know, the countries that are pegged seem to follow the base country interest rate a lot more than the countries that aren't pegged. The advantage of the modern day era is there are different bases. Right. So it's not like we're all following the dollar or all following the gold interest rate or whatever. Now, some countries are clearly more linked to the euro and some countries were linked to former colonial powers and some are linked to the dollar, increasingly more linked to the dollar. And you can see very clearly, you know, you can see very clearly Ireland following British interest rates until 1979 switch over where they're now part of the EMS and they're suddenly following German interest rates. Mm. And you, you can see this. This notion that you know you have to follow whoever you are pegged to, you follow their interest rate, um, and so that's that's what what we found in in kind of this variety of um, in these papers. So the big lesson is, you got to stick to it. Again, there's some marginal trade off, but you got to stick to this this principle, the, the trilemma, or else you will face some kind of financial blow up at some point. And yeah. Let me ask this. So I, I this when I first actually came across this idea was in the late 90s when the emerging market mm-hmm. crisis was going off. So is that a useful framework to, to view what happened like in South Korea, Thailand, Indonesia during that time? I, th- I think those are more, in some sense, almost more the blow up is coming from the financial sector, from okay. kind of excess credit buildup and things like that. Um, I, I think it's much more, it's, it's, it's trying to describe to policymakers where the constraints are, okay. right? And, um, and like I said, I think, Sometimes it, there's a misnomer where people say, well, you've got to pick one corner. You know, you've got to, mm-hmm. you've got to kind of have two sides and none of the other. And I, I think in subsequent work, uh, we had a paper called Rounding the Corners of the Trilemma, Michael yeah. Klein and I did, where we were trying to see if, you know, kind of subtle dis- gradations mattered where, hey, what if instead of keeping my exchange rate rigidly fixed, I just try to keep it, you know, kind of fixed. I try to, you know, not let it move too much. And, well, you know, lo and behold, you seem to follow the base country a little less. Um, and what if I have some capital controls? Well, that that seems like that may help a little bit, maybe not quite as much, but mm-hmm. but some. And so I think this idea that you're making trade-offs all the time, I think you're right in terms of the blow-up issue. It's if you try to do, you know, all three simultaneously, it's not going to end well, okay. right? Like eventually you're, you're going to build excesses. You up. build excesses. I, I guess my impression, like 97, 98, you know, Asia, Russia, uh, Brazil, that there, there were these other financial imbalances that built up, yeah. but, but to what extent was the creation of those imbalances the result of these countries doing too much on all three corners? I, I think it, it may be some, right? And I think okay. in particular you get if you're you're pegged and people think they can take out loans in foreign currency because you've told them the exchange rate's never yeah. going to change, right? You know, what are they supposed right, to do? Right. You told them it'll never change, and so you can you can get excess borrowing and buildups in these situations. Um, where maybe you should have headed them off earlier and raised interest rates, but that's hard because you're pegged. And if you raise the interest rates, you may appreciate. And so you wind up being unable to use monetary policy in a way you probably should. In some sense, it's almost, you're not violating the trilemma, but you're not doing with monetary policy what you probably should to head off the future crisis because of the constraints of the Mm -hmm. trilemma. And then, well, you let excess credit build up in your system and it doesn't usually end well. Well, let's move to... International reserve growth. You you have a paper, you several papers on this. I looked at one, the financial stability, the trilemma, and international reserves, two thousand ten. Yeah. So so what is behind the rapid growth of emerging market reserves? So I think um, 
people had often been telling two stories, um, one of which is pure mercantilism, right? I'm, uh-huh. I'm trying to stay undervalued because I want to run big current account surpluses and grow. I think export-led growth is my route, so I'm going to try to stay undervalued. And as part of that, I just have to keep intervening to, to buy more and more reserves to keep my currency cheap. Um, that's one story in some sense. Um, and there's another one of it was all self-insurance. Countries saw the Asia crisis. They didn't like mm-hmm. the way it went. And they didn't want to have to go hat in hand to the IMF, so they wanted to purely self-insure. And I think I, we didn't want to discount either of those stories. I think there's something going on with both of those. But we thought there was another story going on that we, we weren't seeing as discussed as much, um, which was this idea that if you have a growing banking, central banks who have some preference for exchange rate stability, not a pure peg even necessarily, but they don't want to just let the exchange rate move too much. If you have open financial markets, one of the things you're worried about is in some sense, you know, your money supply leaking out of the country in a panic, right? You, you worry about a bank run, not just on a bank, but on your country in a right. sense. And so one of the things you do about that is you build up a big stock of reserves. And so I think that's one of the, the things that you, you saw countries doing is saying while their banking system was growing. So what we found just empirically was if if you were open and you had a relatively fixed exchange rate, when M2 was going up, you let your reserves go up too because you were in some sense trying to back your banking system. Okay. And, and if you go back to the gold standard, we saw you know plenty of discussion of people way back in the central banking literature and the gold standard just talking very explicitly about this, that, well, of course, the central bank needs gold to back the, the financial system. Um, because if there's a run on the banking system out of the country, they'd have to break the gold standard unless they had enough gold to back the currency. So you, and this became in some sense a similar story. If you want to be able to deal with a bank run without causing your currency to depreciate, you're going to need foreign currency. And so what we found was just empirically, it seemed like this motivation was there too. It's not that there was no mercantilist motivation in some countries, actually, interestingly, we kept finding we could trace China's reserve growth really, really clearly till around, I think it was 2003. And then hmm. it started leaving the lot, the regression line. It started, okay. they were getting more and more reserves than we would have thought they needed. And, um, and so I think it's a useful perspective because sometimes people would talk just about, can you buy six months worth of imports or, uh, with your reserves? So in case you suddenly faced a crisis and we just, we didn't see that at all in the data anymore. Other people would say, well, it's can you back a certain amount of short term external debt? And again, it was just hard to see that was the motivation. Whereas this idea, if you've got a growing banking system, you may need more reserves. That did seem to have some explanatory power and and help us understand why some countries had growing reserves. And again, there are some countries who have grown way beyond even what that story would tell you, um, where you do look and you say this does seem like they're trying to stay undervalued at a certain point in time and maybe for, for different types of reasons. But it, it at least struck us as something as kind of a missing story that was out there. Well, let me throw in another story. And, and maybe this is a part of the self-insurance story. Maybe it's a part of the one you just said. But I think it might be distinct. And that is the demand for safe assets from yeah. the per- following perspective. So assume there had been no emerging market crisis. So it wasn't necessarily a self-insurance motive. But Let's assume that these these emerging markets are growing rapidly, right? Mm-hmm. They're growing really rapidly, and they're growing faster than their institutional quality. Yeah. So they they don't you know have that have the deep capital markets, the rule of law, and so they're as they get wealthier, they're going to by just by nature want to have demand more safe assets. And they look around the world, they come to the U.S. and they find treasuries, maybe some from Europe as well. Right. Um, is, is that part of the story? Is that different? Or is that the same? So I think it's similar in the sense that if it were if it were purely private individuals who wanted more of the safe assets, right, it wouldn't show up as the reserves growth necessarily, okay. right? Because the reserves, it's purely in the central okay. bank. But to the, to the extent that you think the central bank is, wants to hold a safe asset uh, to back the banking system and assets produced domestically aren't safe enough mm-hmm. to be that reserve you could use in a crisis, you know, that I think is the place it becomes very similar okay. where you say in a crisis, they, they are going to want something that is highly liquid and that they can sell and that their own assets don't fit that bill. Okay. And so if the banking system grows, they're going to need more and more of that same okay, asset a similar to back story. it. So it becomes, I think, I think it has uh, a lot of kind of parallels. It's, it's this demand for liquid, very safe assets, yes. w- whether it's the private or the public sector. Exactly. Recording. 
All right. In the time we have left, I want to jump to the Eurozone crisis. Sure. You had a really great Brookings paper on it, the Euro's three crisis. And uh, you, you lay out there was a banking crisis, the sovereign debt crisis, and then the growth crisis. Yeah. So maybe summarize those for us uh, as, as they relate to the Eurozone. Sure. So I think the idea behind that paper was just trying to get across that um, at times people kept referring to it as strictly a sovereign debt crisis. And, you know, there was a great quote from the German finance minister that there is no Euro crisis. There is a, a debt crisis in some European countries <laughs> um, and trying to say this has nothing systemic to it and nothing mm -hmm. broader. And I think this is trying to say, look, there are three things that are very interconnected and the interconnections matter because the obvious policy solutions to one may make the others worse. And if you try to think of it just as one at a time, you might make things worse. And so the idea was, look, you've got a banking crisis. Your banks are close to insolvent. Um, and one of the things making that worse is the growth crisis. Your economy's not growing. You're getting more non-performing loans because of that. And that's hard for the banks. Um, on the other hand, the fact that the banks are in trouble is bad for the growth because they're not lending. Right. And then on the other hand, the sovereign debt crisis means on the one hand, People are worried that your government can't backstop the banks if necessary. And on the other hand, when the banks are going under, that's taking down the sovereign. That's why you have a sovereign mm -hmm. debt crisis in many cases. Um, and then lastly, the growth is causing the sovereign debt crisis right. because no one's there's your revenues are going down. And problematically, the solution to the sovereign debt crisis, austerity, was making the growth, growth crisis and the banking crisis even worse. And so I think that was the idea was to try to say, you need to look at these things holistically and not make two worse whenever you fix one. Yeah. Well, let me throw in another story, sure. one that I like. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but my, yeah. my, my argument is that the ECB played a large role I, yeah. in affecting it, particularly that, that growth one, which may feed into the other ones, and even making austerity worse is you know, they actually raised rates in 2008. I, I've been critical of the Fed for not doing enough in 2008, but it could have been worse. Yes. It could have been the ECB. <laughs> And then moreover, so the, everyone goes to the Great Recession and the ECB had an even more adverse reaction to inflation than the Fed did. But um, in 2011, they raised way, rates twice. Yes, that was one of the great own goals of monetary policy making <laughs> history, I think. Um, yeah. So, no, I, I actually very much agree with your work on this, that I, I don't know. I, I don't think I would lay it all at the feet of the ECB. Okay. But I mean, in, in the paper, when I was trying to say, well, what would make things better? You know, one like front and center was looser monetary policy would help all three of these. Yeah. Right. And you you would do, you know, that's a solution that is dealing with the holistic problem. And and the in some sense, flip side to that is, you know, tighter monetary policy was making all three of these right, worse. Right. Right. And right. that this was a real problem. I think there were fiscal problems, especially in Greece, and there were banking system problems right. and kind of structural buildups of imbalances across the euro area. But tightening monetary policy on in the top face of, all of those that, yeah. was just, in some sense, triggering a bigger and bigger crisis. Yeah, I, I guess you're talking about the paper I wrote on this, but when I wrote that, one of the referee reports was, well, isn't the fundamental problem the Eurozone itself? It's not, it was never really a truly optimal currency area, and you build, therefore you're going to have yeah. these structural problems build up. And, and yeah, monetary policy was bad, but you're walking into a minefield already. I, I mean, I think there was a minefield, but the rate hikes just made it much, much right, worse. Right. Right? No, I, I, and and yep. so to me, um, there were there were huge structural flaws, right? Like you had banks that were backstopped by the national governments, despite the fact that they were real European banks. And so they, you know, we think our banks are big, but as a share of GDP, many European mm. banks, you know, dwarf the country. How on earth is the country supposed to adequately backstop that bank in a crisis? It can't. You know, Ireland had something like 30 or 40 percent De deficit to GDP in one year because they backstopped the banks in that year. Amazing. And and then you 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 know we would never ask Delaware or Washington to backstop the banks that are chartered in those states, right? Yep. They're U.S. banks. And so I think in the same way, um, Europe had all these structural flaws. But I would agree that you know the policy choices. You know, if you had had looser monetary policy and less austerity, I think you come the structural flaws are still there, but you come through looking a lot better. Yeah. And the adjustments that needed to take place with the imbalances would have been much, much, much less painful in a world with with looser monetary policy. You needed relative price changes across Europe. You can do that with 1% inflation in Germany and negative 4 in Spain, Portugal, and Greece. Or you could do it with 1% inflation in Spain, Portugal, and Greece and 5% inflation in Germany. 
you know, the, the, that well, last one is a lot less painful. Yeah, so that, that's, that's, I was going to ask this question. So inflation has been really low in the year zone. Yes. So the ECB's had a harder time than the Fed in hitting its target. And, and I've heard this argument made, and I, I've echoed it, and it may not be accurate, but let me run it by you. If the ECB had higher inflation, even just a temporary overshoot, they maintain the long-run target, but what would have happened is that the core countries which had, they were close to full employment, would have seen inflation go up first. Yep. Greece, Spain would have seen very little inflation. You would have had that scenario you just described yes. where, you know, because they're at full employment, inflation goes up quickly there. Thus, you have the real exchange rate adjustments that are needed. Greece and the periphery is much better off. Is that a reasonable story? I think it's an absolutely reasonable story. And I think, you know, related to that is when you're in a solvency crisis, the denominator matters, mm. right? And the denominator here is nominal GDP. Yeah. And I think people often forget the first word there, that it's nominal GDP that counts here. And so having falling prices in Greece or Spain is just making their debt crisis worse, right? Yeah. It's making it worse for the individuals who see either their assets or their salaries going down and they still got the same nominal debt. It makes it worse for the country that has a shrinking nominal GDP, but they still have these fixed nominal debts out there. And so I think... Um, it made solving these crises a lot harder that the route to solving them that was expected was to have literally falling price levels in some of these countries, as opposed to saying, look, the right answer out of this is we at minimum, I mean, setting aside whether they could have lifted the inflation target, they could have at least just hit it, right? Like right. that would have been progress. And I mean that not only joking, but had the European Central Bank hit 2% for the last seven years, I actually think you would have seen a markedly different outcome in these countries um, than instead constantly falling short of it and being close to zero at times, which was just, you know, I think made it really, really hard for countries that were on the the kind of the the deficit side to, to come out of this. So my question is, can the Eurozone really work? Because yeah, part of the way I, I look at the problem, I know there's, there's the banking problem, there's these other deep structural problems, but I think monetary policy itself is always going to have a challenge. You know, you think of a like a Taylor rule for yeah. all the different countries. Well, I mean, the, the Taylor rule that the ECB follows seems to be more closely um, made for Germany and the core country. It, it works relatively well, and that's, I think, reasonable because it's a big part of the Eurozone. Right. So the ECB is looking at these aggregate, aggregate inflation. They're not looking, you know, they, they don't look at regional. It's like the Fed doesn't look at Texas or, right. or you know, Florida. And so they're always going to be, you know, doing this one-size-fits-all monetary policy, which may be way off for the periphery. So are you hopeful they can work through this, or is it a systemic problem that will continue? I think it's a problem that continues, but I think they don't. that doesn't mean it continues as bad as it is right now. Okay. I, mean, I think in some ways the optimist in me looks back at that paper I wrote in at the end of 2011 or early 2012, and I had some things that I – people were telling me to take out of the paper because that's crazy. They're never going to do that. And you just look like a <laughs> loon by putting that in. And they've done some of those things, not because I suggested them. I mean, mm -hmm. that was trying to distill some of the conventional wisdom out there. And there were things that looked politically difficult. You know, I don't think you could have forecast in 2010 that Draghi would step forward and say, whatever it takes, I'll buy whatever mm -hmm. you need me to buy. You know, the liquidity counter is going to be open if needed. You know, that, that was, that's crazy for the ECB <laughs> to be saying that. And they got there by 2012. The banking union, they're making, they are making progress there. It's hard because there are legacy issues. I mean, as someone said to me once, you know, look, if you tell me there's European federal deposit insurance, I can pass a law tomorrow that says all my homeowners are allowed to default on their mortgage. My banks are insolvent and Europe has to bail them out. Mm. Right. And so there are real issues of sovereignty and institutional structure that are hard to fix. Um, but they are making halting progress there. I think the thing that has made it harder, I, I do think, honestly, a combination of austerity ideology and tight money ideology at the ECB has just made all this harder. So it's not as institutionally permanently flawed as you might worry. I do think, look, it's not as good an optimal currency area as the United States, right? It's it's just not. The The economy has more diverse shocks than the United States has it deals with, it doesn't have the labor and mobility the United States has, and it doesn't have the fiscal federalism the United States has, where fiscal policy cushion shocks across regions. Mm -hmm. That's going to make it a lot harder to run one monetary policy. It doesn't make it impossible. It just means you're going to have more pain at times. Um, and so if they've made the choice that the pain is worth it, I think they can get okay. through this. Um, but I do think you're right. I mean, there are going to be times where the Taylor rule is screaming, 
raise rates for Ireland as it was in 2006 and seven. And they weren't because you had Germany and France that didn't need it. And yeah. there are going to be times like now where the Taylor rule is saying go sharply negative and the ECB is stuck at zero um, when frankly Germany would probably rather they raise rates. Uh, so I think you're going to face problems like this across countries with asymmetric shocks. Very interesting. Well, our time is up. Our guest today has been Jay Shamba. Jay, thank you for being on the show. It's been a real pleasure. It's a fun conversation. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.